Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel Sugar Mama TV. I am incredibly excited to introduce everyone to Lars Croyer, who has basically demystified investing. He was actually an incredibly successful hedge fund manager that decided he needed to tell the truth. He needed to share with everyone the truth behind investing and that investing really isn't that hard. It is incredibly simple and you do not need to try and beat the market. He has a huge wealth of experience and knowledge and hardcore facts that will help you understand and realize how simple it is to invest, how easy it is to build up an investment portfolio and the two areas where you must invest if you want to be a long-term successful investor. Now Lars, um, thank you so much for your time. Um, I've done so much stalking of you so I already know so much about you but can you just first of all tell me about yourself, your history and how you fell into the finance market? Oh sure, um, so my, well, I'm Danish mm -hmm. um, but I did all my education in the US. Uh, Lars went to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> went to Harvard. Um, I was actually originally going to get a PhD and be a professor but then I had a lot of debt so I ended up in a job on Wall Street. Then went to business school and then ended up in the hedge fund world, which at the time was growing tremendously. Then I started my own fund mm -hmm. here in London um, and did that for quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, and then incredibly fortuitous, incredibly luckily in early 08, I gave all my investors their money back mm -hmm. and continued just with my own funds, but essentially stopped. Okay. Um, and I've since uh, written a couple of books mm -hmm. There's sort of two and a half, and a half because it's part of a third book. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I still sit on the board of a number of hedge funds. Okay. So just, um, but yeah, so that's my background. Okay. First of all, for the viewers who don't know what a hedge fund is, can you simply explain yeah. it in a really simple way? Yeah, but it's, it's a hedge fund, think of it essentially as a, um, a fund. Actually, it's interesting where the term came from. It came from, uh, there was a gentleman who started a fund, so a fund where you buy a bunch of shares, mm -hmm. And then he hedged it, so he guarded against falls in share prices. And we can get technical about how you do that. But so hedge fund was meant to be a fund where um, you essentially can invest in a way that doesn't necessarily depend on the movements of the market. Okay. So man, markets go up and down, but the fund does sort of go up slowly, regardless of the market. Now hedge funds have simply become many, many things. Mm, yes. But that's <laughs> that's original. Yeah. So you've gone from you know being. A like working for a hedge fund and then having your own hedge fund. Um, what made you so decide, like realize that actually this isn't the right way of doing things, that mm. this was a, quite complicated and expensive and not necessarily the best thing for people, for the everyday person yeah. that wants to invest? Well, I think uh, to be a little bit fair to myself, I, um, I don't think anything has changed okay. in one sense because I've always felt that people like my mom, I often think of my mother in, in this context, and she would call me up and she thought she had the perfect angle because she had a son who lived in, in London who had a hedge fund. Yeah. So just ask him. Mm. And I thought it was terrible because she would buy stocks, and she lives in Denmark, she would buy stocks because they had gone up a lot or she had seen an ad or something. So she was just like like randomly and like grabbing at stuff, right? Like she and read and she is a lovely, and, a lovely lady and all this, but, um, but she has absolutely no chance whatsoever of outperforming myself and my peers mm -hmm. who have access to a phenomenal amount of information to companies to technology to anything you can imagine and we had some of the brightest minds in finance working for us so the chances that my mother who could could sit at home north of Copenhagen pay far higher fees mm -hmm. would outperform us is ridiculous so I always felt that you know, just the, the first question anyone has to ask themselves is not whether markets can be beaten or not. Mm -hmm. um, it's whether you can beat the markets. Yep. So who are you? Well, you is anyone who considers investing. Mm -hmm. And it's my view and all, frankly always was, that you are overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly unlikely to be able to beat the markets. But it's the first and most important decision. Now, a lot of stuff follows from that. Mm -hmm. But if you can get into your head, the, that this is highly unlikely, and then you consider all the fees and expenses and so forth, a sort of world of not being able to beat the market opens up. Okay. And that's the message I wanted to get across. So, you know, that sounds like you're just encouraging not to invest, which obviously is not the case at all. Mm. You're simply saying don't try and become, you know, a, a, a trader or a stock market guru or anything like that. Hand it over, 
the two a hedge fund expert that may end up charging a whole pile of fees mm. and may get it wrong or right or makes your life so much easier and simpler and more liberating mm. by investing in a different mm. way now you've done a huge amount of research and, and essentially what you're recommending is that we invest in index funds mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, through ETFs, mm -hmm. ETF, index ETFs or index mutual funds or managed funds as mm -hmm. we call them in Australia. Yeah. What are the key reasons for yeah. why we should be scrapping all this like hedge fund stock picking yeah. you know, things that just waste our time and investing purely in, in index funds because essentially it's just buying and holding. So just so splitting into a couple of bits. So the first is can you yourself beat the market? Right? And let's say you come to the conclusion this is stuff like should I buy Facebook over Google? Mm -hmm. Should I, you know, will Microsoft go up or an Apple beat the markets? Who knows? Mm. You can't. Yep. Or you're overwhelmingly likely that you can't. So then the next thing that happens, you drive to work and you see all these ads for the star fund manager mm -hmm. who has beaten the markets nine out of the last 10 years. And the question is, why don't you just give that person our money? Because mm -hmm. then they're in safe hands. Yep. And all your local banks and your local advisors are highly likely to advise you to do that. Now, so then you have to say, okay, so what are the chances that I pick what's called an active fund? So mm -hmm. essentially you think of someone wearing a suit who's very smart and very well paid to do the picking for you. Mm -hmm. What are the chances that they beat the market? Now statistically speaking, the chances that an actively managed fund beats the stock market over a 10 year period is about one in 10. There's about 10 to 15 percent of funds will be able to do that over a 10 year period. Which means that unless you could tell in advance mm -hmm. who that fund was and if you can you're a magician mm. then you will unlikely pick you're unlikely to pick that one fund yeah and you're left worse off by picking randomly mm. which most people would be yeah right? so then you say okay so you shouldn't pick stocks yourself and don't pick an, a, 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 an actively managed fund because they don't do better than the market mm -hmm. the thing you should do is simply buy the market Okay, which is through an index fund. Which is, an, so yeah, market is, think of the stock market, there are many, many thousands of stocks and you create index, uh, index indices around uh, the stock markets and there'll be indices with names like S&P 500 as a theme one, the Dow is the first one, mm -hmm. so forth, there'll be a, there are indices in Australia and every mm -hmm. country has an index. And then, so what I'm saying is buy the index, okay, okay? and we're still just talking stock and we're talking yeah. about every asset class you want. Just buy the index, and why do you? Why should you buy the index? Well, you think about what the index does. It simply tracks the stocks. Mm -hmm. So it is incredibly simple to create that product. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a computer can do it. A monkey can create yeah. that product. And as a result, they're incredibly cheap. And they're also really well diversified. So you're eliminating so much risk out of your portfolio because if you look within, say, one index fund, I mean, how many stocks can be? So that depends on the index, right? Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, the very first index, I think, was 30 stocks, the Dow index, yeah. and constructing the way you wouldn't do it today. But if we can take it one step further and say, so there are, there are indices for anything. Mm -hmm. There's an index for every country in the world, every industry in the yeah, world, and so forth. Mm -hmm. But if you want maximum diversification, mm -hmm. which you should, and we can talk about why, you should pick the World Equity Index Tracker. Okay. Okay? Yes. So what does that mean? That means that it's, a, it's a, a, an investment product, mm -hmm. and we're still just in the share yep. space, equity And space. just so you know, inside the $1,000 project portfolio, this... Um, this investment actually exists. I love that. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, well, I personally invest in this way and as well as I, 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 I own a bunch of them myself. <laughs> but so, so, so what does that mean? So that means, man, you have the world and you can buy stocks from mm -hmm. all over the world mm -hmm. through one product. Okay. That's what that is. And they are allocated according to the size of the stock markets mm -hmm. of all of these countries. Yes. So there's the, the U.S. has the largest presence, mm -hmm. and then you sort of filter down to some countries that are barely represented. Yep. An example of one of the fund managers, which is actually in the Sugar Mama um, uh, $1,000 project portfolio, is the Vanguard All yep. World um, ETF. Yep. It's a great one. It's the, I mean, the fees, I mean, a hedge fund would charge around 2% per annum, whether no, they're more, making more than that, or, yeah. more, <laughs> plus, plus a bonus if they make over a certain amount. Plus all the fees and expenses. Everything just gets, yeah, whereas yeah. I think the Vanguard All World um, Index ETF is I think 0.05 basis points. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's 
yeah. pennies. Very, very little. About. It's very little. It varies a little by country. And you diversify, you're diversifying your money all the way around all over the, world. the world. It's and so much risk then therefore comes off yeah. the table. And if I can just elaborate on that point why it's so traditionally um, in asset management there was a huge um, local concentration risk. So that would mean that the Australian pension funds would invest in Australian stocks, the British and UK stocks and so forth. If you think about, take your personal life and you say that, that invest partly is your investment portfolio but you'll also have other assets like your job, your house, your flat, maybe inheritance, maybe your future job, maybe your spouses and it's all very local. Right? So. Let's say we're right now in London and I might own a flat and some stocks, local stocks, and then insurance product and a car and what have you. All those things tie back to the London economy. Mm. Now, so if that all goes pear-shaped at the same time, you, your whole financial life will be in ruins at the same time for the same reason, namely collapse of the local economy. What this kind of diversified product does is it takes at least some of that risk away. The next question I want to ask you is, you recommend that we, you say the only two investments you need are mm. two different in index funds. Can mm. you explain the two different ones and, mm. and why? So What's just understand what that is. The first one, we're talking about, let's take the Vanguard product you just talked mm. about. Well, you, it's one product. You go and buy one thing, mm. an ETF or what it, whatever it is. The underlying exposure is to thousands of securities across many industries and geographies. So it's one thing, but what it represents mm -hmm. is truly global yes. and diversified. Mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's so through really, that you're you don't buying really a lot. You need anything else but that. For equities, mm -hmm. that's all you need. Mm -hmm. So what, how could you create as incredible portfolios for your equity exposure? Just get that. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, if you look at your overall investment portfolio, you, equities can be risky. We saw in 2008, and there have been other historic examples where equities completely collapsed mm -hmm. globally. Um, and as a result, it may not be right for you to have all that risk in yeah. your portfolio. Mm -hmm. And so how do you buffer that? Mm -hmm. and so the way you can buffer that is if you take Australia, um, and let's say you wanted to take no risk at all. Yeah. Like let's say you just, let's say you had 105 Australian dollars, mm -hmm. and next year you needed 100 for open heart surgery. Right? So you're, you don't want to take any risk yeah, at all. No risk what would you actually yeah. do, right? Don't put it under your pillow. Mm -hmm you can buy a government bond, a mm -hmm. one-year government bond, and that is, if you're in the kind of country like Australia is mm -hmm. actually, that is very high credit worthiness, that is the safest thing you can do with your money. It's safer than putting it in the bank. Mm -hmm. Actually, the Australian government will guarantee the banks. Yes, up to a safer than anything mm -hmm. else, if you buy U.S. Mm -hmm. treasuries, you're taking currency risk. Yep. Right? So, so in your local currency, high credit um, worthy government bond is the lowest risk thing you can get. So now you have something that is no risk at all, mm -hmm. namely your local government bond, in, and you do it in the time horizon that roughly fits your um, investment duration. Right? So if you need the money in 10 years, think of 10-year bonds. If you need it next year, so the hearts, should go. Let's do a better exam the hearts. <laughs> surgery, but then I say um, a little old lady you know, wouldn't invest in um, you know, an equities portfolio, I would say, you know, uh, or someone who's like a 24-year-old, person who's in the start of their working career should be in the, you know, obviously go gang ho right. into the... Um, into Absolutely, the, that's generally the rule. There are all sorts of rules of thumb. Index. But so now you have these two products, mm. right? The low risk one and the equity one. So the and low risk one is the is your local market, like bonds I index? In the government bonds. In, in the government bonds, yeah. not no corporate bonds. Yeah. And then the other one, which is the high growth of, you know, wealth creation opportunity is your all world index fund. So that's essentially what Lars is saying is you have these two and that's it. You don't need to complicate your life by picking stocks. The next question is, is well, how does one know what yeah. proportion? Like do you have 20% of your money in the low risk, 80% in your high risk? Yeah. You know, and this is, this is typically where I exit right because- <laughs> This is where I exit This in. is where you exit, come in, right? Because it depends, well, who are you? Mm. What, like how much can you afford uh, you know, adverse markets? Yeah. How, like you said, a 24-year-old uh, typically can take a lot more risk than mm. an 80-year-old who needs the money. Yeah. Sometimes actually, absolutely an 80-year-old has so much money that they can take they can risk because they they're actually doing it for the next generation, risk. right? And, exactly. Um, I think, um, so it really depends. And, and uh, there are some rules of thumbs that I'm always extremely cautious about because mm. they, there are always so many things that come into it. Yes. Um, and and I think generally speaking, you 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 say the younger you are, the more risk you can take. 
All right. As you get closer, closer to retirement, mm -hmm. you know, you should take To less. make the balance maybe 50-50 or 60-40, just right. so you've still got that benefit of growth, but you still have that, ca that right. some capital protection. Yeah. Um, Lars, thank you so much for demystifying investing. This is so easy for everyone to follow. I'm going to link, um, Lars actually has a YouTube uh, account, which I will link below. There are so many fantastic videos to watch on his channel. I'll also link where to buy his books from, but don't go away because I'm going to be asking Lars some personal questions about investing and the journey of wealth creation in just one second. So stay tuned.